The hour of the time may be contacted at HOT. That's H-O-T-T, P.O. Box 940, Eager, spelled E-A-G-A-R, in the state of Arizona, 85925. Our phone number is 928-333-2942. And our website is www.hourofthetime.com. Good evening, folks, and once again, welcome to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. forget folks don't forget march 15th 8 p.m lafayette hotel 2223 el cajon boulevard san diego i'll be there talking for about three hours showing you some videotape that you've never seen before that will literally blow your mind that's monday march 15th 8 p.m the lafayette hotel 2223 el cajon boulevard san diego now, if you'd like to call and find out about this uh, conference, call area code 619-492-8588. That's 619-492-8588. 
It's $40 admission. If you're a CAGI member, it's $30. CAGI members, please buy your ticket at the conference, not at any of the places that are advertised where you can buy advanced tickets. They cannot accommodate you. CAGI members, buy your tickets at the conference, please. Now, we still need money to help pay for airtime, folks. If you like this show, if you're learning something, if you want this show to stay on the air, make a check or money order out to WWCR. Do it now. Don't wait, because you know what happens when we put things off. Do it now. WWCR and send it to us. Also, ask for a packet of information in the process, and we'll be happy to send you a whole packet full of stuff. Send it to Stan, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or you can call Stan and talk to him on the phone. He's a heck of a nice guy. In fact, you can't get any better than Stan. At 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Now, folks, the Dallas Morning News on October 1st, 1989, published this story. Anglican leader calls for unity under Pope. The byline is Associated Press. Rome, Anglican leader, Archbishop Robert Runcie, calls Saturday for all Christians to accept the Roman Catholic Pope as a common leader presiding in love. For the Universal Church, I renew the plea, he said. Could not all Christians come to reconsider the kind of primacy the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, exercised within the early church? Again, folks, that was in the Dallas Morning News, October 1st, 1989. This story appeared in the Bakersfield, Californian, August 27th, 1989. Baptist and Catholic theologians find common ground. Associated Press, New York. Southern Baptists and Roman Catholics, the nation's two largest denominations, generally have been regarded as doctrinally far apart, but their scholars find they basically agree. The 163-page report is seen as the most full-scale mutual examination of respective positions of the two traditions. Achieving it was an unprecedented experience for Southern Baptists, commonly averse to ecumenical affairs. The talks, sponsored by the Catholic Bishops' Committee on Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs and the Southern Baptist Department of Interfaith Witness, involved 18 meetings between 1978 and 1988. Again, that appeared in the Bakersfield, California, on August 27, 1989. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully during this broadcast, for the message tonight is extremely important. And understand that I am not attacking Catholics or anyone else. I am merely giving you the results of our research, and sometimes the results of this research is disturbing. It shows how we've been misled and deceived over hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. You see, folks, more wars have been fought and more blood has been shed in the name of religion than any other cause, perhaps all other causes. Countless millions have been slaughtered in the name of God, Allah, Buddha, Muhammad, Christ for thousands of years. Christian killing Jew, Jew hating Muslim, the Muslim against the Hindu, Christian fighting Christian, Shiite versus Sunni, Sikh against Hindu. Endless rivers of blood supposedly shed to rid the world of evil men and make way for peace. And of course, it never happens. And that's what they say about this new world order that it's going to rid the world of evil men and make way for a thousand years of peace. Well, is it possible for people of varied faiths and cultures to live at peace in this world? When one considers the fragmentation and division even among Christians or the never-ending conflict between Palestinian and Jew, prospects for peace seem very, very dim. Some, aware of the dark record of history, would abolish all religion. Some would combine all religion, as is the intent in the New World Order, and anyone who refused will simply be exterminated. Today, something unmatched in history is taking place. Leading statesmen and religious leaders are proposing a new world order. A plan that many sincerely believe can bring peace on earth. 
a unity is envisioned that will transcend instinctive barriers that have long separated cultures and religions. Significant progress toward a new world order is seen in the spirit of ecumenism, or togetherness, now being urged by prominent religious leaders and being brought to reality to fruition by the World Council of Churches. In the ecumenical plan, basic theological or ideological differences are set aside, while emphasis is instead placed upon those elements common to most religions. And I can tell you that the New World religion will be a religion that serves man, because man is to become God in the New World Order. And the religion will change with the needs of man. Could the long desired universal peace be just around the corner? Could this succeed? Is it actually possible for men to forge a lasting peace on the anvil of compromise? Or could it be that we are naively forging not a New World Order, but rather the one world order of apocalyptic prophecy? Or is it all an invention of the mind of man throughout the ages to manipulate large masses and populations of people? I make no judgment and I do not try to answer all of these questions. You must do that in your own mind. But I must ask those questions, for many of you have never even thought to ask them. While controversial, folks, it is not the purpose of this program, The Hour of the Time, to disparage or attack the honest convictions of any sincere persons, whatever their politic or faith, for I am a true constitutionalist, and I believe that we each have the right to believe whatever we wish, no matter who likes it or dislikes it, and worship at the altar of whichever God we choose, no matter who likes it or who dislikes it. It happens to be one of the precepts of living in freedom. You must understand that. No one's right to believe what they want or practice the religion what, that they want can be hindered until the practice of that religion or the activation of those beliefs infringe upon the freedom of someone else. Now, I sincerely, in my heart and in my soul, believe this. Without this belief, man cannot live in freedom and must be subjected to slavery, and any intelligent, free-thinking person can quickly make that connection. That is why, even if you do not like the ravings of the Nazi speaker standing on the street corner, he must be allowed to stand and rave. And if you wish to listen, that is your business. If you wish to close your ears and walk away, that also is your business. But when you shut him up, you shut yourself up, no matter who you are or what it is that you say. For what we do to one, we do to all. Therefore, understand that this is a program bringing you information, and we hope education, and it is not designed to attack any one, but merely to shine some light in the dark corners of history where light has not been found before. You see, our purpose is to bring out facts and principles which have a bearing upon coming events. For those of you who may not realize it, this is not a religious show. This is not a religious show. This is a show that is designed to educate illuminate, if you will, and that's very ironic, because we are illuminating those who call themselves illumined, who have been causing us misery for thousands of years. We're trying to reveal the hidden agenda behind the New World Order, and along with it, the ecumenical movement that almost no one dares to discuss, which is a part of the bringing about of the New World Order. But you see, folks, these issues must be freely discussed, no matter who you are or what you believe. For those who know history know that history repeats. And those who ignore the lessons of history are doomed to repeat the history. As Winston Churchill once observed, folks, the farther backward you can look, 
the farther forward you can see. And that is really the secret why my predictions have been so accurate, so accurate that at this moment, I am the most successful and accurate prophet on the face of this earth. But I'm not really a prophet, I'm a messenger. And they're not prophecy that I give you, they're predictions based upon actual study, research of history and of the plan of those who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages, the practicers of that religion called Mystery Babylon. And it is real, and it doesn't matter if you believe in any of this or not. If the practitioners believe it, it will affect you, especially if they hold powerful positions in the world. And I can assure you that they do. So this is not a religious program, folks. It just happens to be true that the New World Order is founded upon the religious history of the past. And it is all about religion as you will soon see. When Jesus revealed to his disciples the fate of Jerusalem and the scenes of the second advent, he foretold also the experience of his people from the time when he would be taken from them until his return in power and glory for their deliverance. This is what the Bible says. In a few brief utterances of awful significance, Jesus foretold the portion which the rulers of this world would mete out to the church of God in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, verse 21, and verse 22. Now, the reason I am quoting this is because if what is happening is being brought about by religious history, then we must understand that the religious history and the books and the chapters and the verses that this religious history is based upon. For whatever belief is driving the minds of the men that are bringing about the New World Order and the minds of the men who are fighting the New World Order, it must be understood by all the rest of us who don't understand any of this. Or we are surely lost. The history of the early church testified to the fulfillment of Jesus' words. As the fires of persecution were kindled, Christians were stripped of their possessions and driven from their homes. Great numbers sealed their testimony with their blood. Noble and slave, rich and poor, it didn't matter, learned and ignorant, were alike slain without mercy. And unless what is coming is stopped, this will repeat itself. These persecutions beginning under Nero, the emperor of Rome, A.D. 55 to 68, about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of all the calamities, famine, pestilence, and earthquake. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as enemies of religion, and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheaters. Some were crucified. Others were covered with the skins of wild animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. And vast multitudes assembled to enjoy these sights and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. For in that day, it was known as the great Roman circus, the football, the Super Bowl of that era. Because they were hunted like beasts of prey, early Christians were forced to seek concealment in desolate and solitary places. Beneath the hills outside the city of Rome, long galleries were tunneled through earth and rock. A dark and intricate network of passages extended for miles beyond the city walls. In these underground retreats, the followers of Christ buried their dead. When the life-giver shall return to awaken those who fought the good fight, many a martyr for Christ's sake will come forth from those gloomy catacombs. In vain were Satan's or Lucifer's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. You see, God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. Said a Christian, quote, You may torment, afflict, and vex us. The more we are mowed down, the more we spring up again. The blood of Christians is seed, unquote. Tertullian, in his Apology, paragraph 50, thousands were imprisoned and slain, but others sprang up to fill their place. Now the great adversary, 
who Christians believe is Satan, also known as Lucifer, but whom the mystery schools believe is Jehovah or Yahweh. The great adversary endeavored to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. Persecution ceased, and in its place were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor. For if they could not stamp out the Christians by violence, by killing them, by crucifying them, by throwing them to the lions and to the dogs and to the gladiators, if they could not get rid of them in that manner, and if the empire was threatened by them, then there had to be a way to save the Roman Empire, to save the emperor from that pestilence known as Christianity. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. They professed to accept Jesus as the Son of God and to believe in his death and resurrection, but they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or of a change of heart. With some concessions on their part, they proposed that Christians should make concessions, that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Now the church was in fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire, and sword were blessings in comparison with this. Some of the Christians stood firm, declaring that they could make no compromise. Others were in favor of yielding or modifying some features of their faith and uniting with those who accepted a part of Christianity, urging that this might be the means of their full conversion. And that was a time of deep anguish for the faithful followers of Christ, according to the written history of the Christian religion. This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, foretold the great apostasy. Quote, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God." Unquote. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, and that prophecy has come true. As man stands in the temple of the body today and declares himself to be God. And furthermore, the apostle warned his brethren that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And what is the mystery of iniquity? It is the mystery religion of Babylon, the worship of the heavens, the Osirian cycle of which the sun is the symbol of the intellect. Even at that early date, he saw creeping into the church errors that would prepare the way for the development of that gigantic system of false religion, a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne and rule the earth according to his will. The nominal conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing in the world cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Pagan doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. And the Ten Commandments were changed to permit idols in the church. And other changes were made. You see, the day of rest was changed from the seventh day to the first day. Why? Because the first day was the date that the pagan religion worshipped the sun, Osiris, the light, Lucifer, the intellect. And so, the pure and simple teachings of Christ were corrupted beyond recognition. As Christians consented to lower their standards, a union was formed between, between Christianity and paganism. 
Though the worshippers of idols professed to be converted, they united with the church, still clinging to their idolatry, only changing the objects of their worship to images of Jesus and even of Mary and the saints. But they still worshipped the same gods. And they always have. If you look at an aerial view of the Vatican, you will see that the outer courtyard is a round temple of the sun, exactly as the Druids and the Celts built, and that in the center of the temple to the sun, to Osiris, stands the symbol of the lost word of Freemasonry, the phallus, the generative force, the penis of Osiris, the obelisk. You see, folks, the Roman Empire never fell. It just became the Catholic Church. And the Roman Emperor merely changed his name from Emperor to Pope. Now, for those of you who may think that I'm crazy and that I've lost my mind, I'm going to read you verbatim from a book entitled Dungeon, Fire, and Sword. It is the complete history of the Knights Templar and the Crusades, written by John J. Robinson, author of Born in Blood. And I'm going to start at the second, third paragraph on page 414 in the chapter entitled Jesus Wept, 1292-1305. That's a date. Those are dates, folks. In London, Edward sent for the Master of the Knights Templar in England, Brian de Jay. He told the Master of his plans to chastise the upstart William Wallace in Scotland and ask that the Templar Knights go with him to fight for England. The Templar Master saw no barrier to committing his Knights to a totally secular war that had nothing to do with religion or the True Cross. It had been years since the fighting men of the Temple had had anyone to fight. The calls for men and money no longer came from the headquarters in the East. They had no need for them. No monarch they knew in Europe was going to go on a crusade, if even the Pope should call it, which he wouldn't, because the Pope had something much more important on his mind. Boniface the Eighth had come up with a way to increase the papal treasury, a way that could come only once in a hundred years. The following year of 1299 marked the turn of a century, and Boniface would turn the usual secular celebration into a jubilee of joy for all Christians. Now there would be new pathways to the total remission of sins, much easier than going off on crusade. Full absolution was offered to any pilgrim who would come to Rome for fifteen days with his offering for the church, and thus he could fill his coffers. Even at his most optimistic, the Pope had not foreseen the flood of pilgrims that would bring new prosperity to Rome. The local merchants and innkeepers were delighted with the business generated by almost two million pilgrims. Two priests stood all day and night behind the altar at the Church of St. Paul, using rakes to drag away the steady stream of gold and silver offerings placed there by pilgrims who pushed their way through the mob to leave their gifts. Boniface VIII was ecstatic. He remembered the words said to him as the papal crown had been placed on his head. Quote, Take the tiara, and know that thou art the father of princes and kings, the ruler of the world, the vicar on earth of our Savior Jesus Christ, unquote. Now he indeed felt like the ruler of the world, as he staged a regal pageant. He put on the dress and the insignia of the ancient Roman emperors and went out into the streets with two swords held high in front of him, indicating his supreme authority over both the secular and the spiritual worlds with heralds crying out, quote, Behold, I am Caesar, unquote. And this is just one example, because all through history the popes have, on occasion, made public admittance of the fact that Rome just became the church, displayed on the walls of the Vatican, is the double-headed eagle, the insignia of only one man who has ever lived, the emperor of Rome. 
Now, so that I may not be accused of invention, folks, everything that I'm giving you in this broadcast is coming right out of the writings of the historians of the Catholic Church, of the Protestant Church, of the Roman Empire, of the Knights Templar, and many others. You see, I'm not inventing any of this. It happens to be historical fact. And if you have eyes and can see, the emperor, now the pope, to gain converts from heathenism, unsound doctrines, superstitious rites, and the adoration of images and relics were gradually introduced into Christian worship. The decree of a general council, the Second Council of Nice, A.D. 787, finally established this system of Christian idolatry. To complete the sacrilegious work, Rome presumed to erase the Second Commandment, forbidding image worship from the law of God, and to divide the Tenth Commandment to preserve the number. According to Christian historians in the Protestant Church, Satan tampered with the Fourth Commandment also, and purposed to set aside the ancient Sabbath, the day which God had blessed and sanctified, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 and in its stead to exalt the festival observed by the heathen as the venerable day of the sun. This change was not at first attempted openly. In the first centuries, the true Sabbath had been kept by all Christians. They were jealous for the honor of God, and they zealously guarded the sacredness of its precepts. But with great subtlety, Satan worked through his agents to bring about his object. Now don't go away, folks. We've got to take a short break. We'll be right back after this short pause. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. It's not warm when she's away. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. She's always gone too long Anytime she goes away Wonder this time where she's gone Wonder if she's gone to stay Ain't no sunshine when she's gone And this house just ain't no more Anytime she goes away And I know, 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 I know
before the advent of Christ, to load down the Sabbath with the most rigorous exactions, making its observance a burden. He cast contempt upon it as a Jewish institution until finally the pagan Sunday came to be honored as a divine institution, while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were at last declared to be accursed. And the outcome of this is that the Jews have been persecuted throughout history. They have become the scapegoat that you learned about in an earlier broadcast. The spirit of concession to paganism opened the way for a still further disregard of heaven's authority. The visible head of the church, the Pope, came to be almost universally acknowledged as the vice-regent of God on earth, and he was endowed with authority over church and state. More than this, the Pope appropriated the very titles of deity. He styled himself, quote, Lord God the Pope, unquote, assumed infallibility and demanded that all men pay him homage. Faith was transferred from Christ, the true foundation of the Christian church, to the Pope of Rome. Instead of trusting in Christ for forgiveness of sins and for eternal salvation, people looked to the Pope and to the priests and prelates to whom he delegated authority. They were taught that the Pope was their earthly mediator, and that none could approach God except through him, and further, that he stood in the place of God to them, and was therefore to be implicitly obeyed. A deviation from his requirements was cause for the severest punishment to be visited upon the bodies and souls of the offenders. Through this error the people were turned from God to fallible, erring men. Blasphemous titles claimed for the Pope have been embellished and enlarged over the centuries, but a few of these boastful claims appear in a, an ecclesiastical Roman Catholic dictionary. I'm taking this right out of a Roman Catholic dictionary by Lucius Ferraris, entitled Prompta Bibliotheca Anonica, Volume 6, pages 438, 442, Article, Pope, the Catholic Encyclopedia, 1913 edition. Volume 6, page 48, speaks of this book as a veritable encyclopedia of religious knowledge and a precious mine of information. Those are the words of the Vatican. Quote, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. Unquote. Remember, the Roman emperors were deified. Quote, Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Unquote. That is an exact word-for-word -word description of Osiris. Quote, So that if it were possible that the angels might err in the faith or might think contrary to the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. Unquote. Quote, The Pope is, as it were, God on earth sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief king of kings, having plenitude of power, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction, not only of the earthly, but also of the heavenly kingdom, unquote. If that's not blasphemy, according to the definition, then I don't know what is, folks. Quote, the Pope can modify divine law, and since his power is not of man, but of God, unquote. The Pope can modify divine law? Well, you see that he did. He changed the day of rest, dictated by God, from the seventh day to the first day. And he changed the Ten Commandments to allow the worship of idols. But the doctrine of papal supremacy is directly opposed to the teachings of any scripture that I am able to find. Quote, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Quote, unquote. That's in Luke chapter 4, verse 8. God has never given a hint in his word that he appointed any man but Christ to be the head of the church. The Bible exalts God and places finite men in their true position. The Pope has no power over Christ's church except by usurpation, and that's true only if you are a Christian. If you are a Jew, if you are a Muslim, if you are a Buddhist, none of that is true, is it? By the 6th century, folks, the papacy was firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. 
pagan Rome had given place to papal Rome. The ascension of the Roman Church to power marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, the darkness of superstition and error deepened. Those were days of pearl for the Church of Christ. Faithful standard bearers were few. At times it seemed that error and superstition would wholly prevail, and true religion would be banished from the earth. The gospel was lost sight of, and the forms of religion were multiplied. People were taught not only to look to the Pope as their mediator, but to trust to works of their own to atone for sin. Long pilgrimages, acts of penance, the worship of relics, the erection of churches, shrines, and altars, the payment of large sums to the church, these and many similar acts were enjoined to appease the wrath of God or to secure his favor. As if God were like men, to be angered at trifles or pacified by gifts or acts of penance, and even then the church still worshipped the old gods. For in dismantling churches for renovation throughout Europe, throughout Europe, without exception, and the older the church, the more likely it was to be true. Enshrined within the altar, out of sight of the priests and the worshippers, were found stone penises, symbols of the lost word of Freemasonry, the phallus of Osiris, the generative force of the pagan religion of the worship of the sun, the light, Lucifer, the intellect. This is historic fact. This is not invention, but fact. About the close of the 8th century, Papas put forth the claim that in the first ages of the church, the bishops of Rome had possessed the same spiritual power which they now assumed. To establish this claim, ancient writings were forged by monks, and it has been proven that they were forged. Decrees of councils before unheard of were discovered, establishing the universal supremacy of the Pope from the earliest times, and a church that had rejected the truth greedily accepted these deceptions. Another step in papal assumption was taken when in the 11th century Pope Gregory VII proclaimed the perfection of the Roman Church. Among the propositions which he put forth was one declaring that the Church had never erred, nor would it ever err according to the Scriptures. But I wonder what they told Galileo when they imprisoned him for being right that the earth revolved around the sun and that the earth was not the center of the universe and that the universe did not revolve around the earth. I wonder what they told Galileo. How did they justify being right when they were obviously wrong, and not only with Galileo, but Diodoro do Bruno and many others? Many, many others, as a matter of fact, many of whom were burned at the stake for daring to disagree with what was then considered to be politically correct. For many of them had discovered scientific truths, and when they espoused these truths, were declared to be heretics and were burned at the stake, because the Pope declared these truths to be falsehoods. And that, folks, was the birth of the doctrine known as political correctness. And you see it reappearing now, where truths are again declared to be false, because they are not politically correct. What are you going to accept in this world? Now, once again, I want to tell you, we're not attacking anyone. I care not what you believe. I care not what altar you worship at, for I am a true constitutionalist. It makes no difference to any of you what my religion is, although I will freely tell you, tell you that I attempt in my daily life to follow the true words of Christ, not the doctrine or the preachings of any church or any evangelist or any book, but those words attributed to Christ and only to Christ. And, as the rock upon which those words stand, the Ten Commandments as given to Moses by God, that is the sum total of my religion, of my beliefs, of what I practice in my daily life. I'm not asking you to do that at all. But I am asking everyone 
to quit accepting what they are told, to begin an honest, individual, personal search for the truth. For we can no longer live in deception. We can no longer live the lies of the past. Great change lies ahead of us, folks. Change will come whether we want it or not, for that is the way of the world and the way of the universe. And if we are still living in lies and deceptions and manipulations, then that change will be for the bad, just as it has always been throughout the history of the world. And blood will flow and people will suffer, all in the name, once again, of religion. And I, for one, am sick of it. Sick of it. We must discover the truth, and we must lead our lives by the truth, and we must take the truth into the future, and we must determine the future from the truth, and nothing else. Nothing else. Or if we do not, those who have decided that they are the only truly mature minds, and thus the only ones capable of rule, because the rest of us do not use our intelligence, and thus are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent, no better than animals who do not have intelligence. They have determined that they are going to shackle us once again in slavery, because we cannot control ourselves, or rule ourselves, or live by the truth. This is what they have determined, right or wrong, whether you believe them or whether you believe that they know what they claim that they know or not. It is what they have determined, and I assure you they are in control right now. Right now. Right this moment. And in this country, their headquarters is in the temple without windows, exactly 13 blocks from the White House. The headquarters of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Now, when the Pope declared that the Church had never erred, nor would it ever err, according to the Scriptures, the scriptural proofs did not accompany the assertion. Next, the proud Pontiff claimed the power to depose emperors and declared that no sentence which he pronounced could be reversed by anyone, but that it was his prerogative to reverse the decisions of all others. The advancing centuries witnessed a constant increase of error in the doctrines put forth from Rome. Even before the establishment of the papacy, the teachings of heathen philosophers had received attention and exerted an influence in the church. Prominent among these was the belief in man's natural immortality and his consciousness in death. This doctrine laid the foundation upon which Rome established the invocation of saints and the adoration of the Virgin Mary. From this sprang also the heresy of eternal torment for the finally impenitent which was early incorporated into the papal faith. And thus, uh, once again, the worship of Osiris and Mary and the child Horus, disguised under different names, emerged as a religion from the veil out into the open. The only thing that has changed is the names. Then the way was prepared for the introduction of still another invention of paganism, which Rome named purgatory and employed to terrify the superstitious multitudes. By this heresy is affirmed the existence of a place of torment in which the souls of such as have not merited eternal damnation are to suffer punishment for their sins and from which when freed from impurity they are admitted to heaven. The scriptural ordinance of the Lord's Supper was supplanted by the idolatrous sacrifice of the Mass. Papist priests pretended by their senseless mummery to convert the simple bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Christ. And those are the exact words, body and blood of Christ, written by Cardinal Wiseman. The real presence of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Eucharist proved from Scripture, Lecture 8, Section 3, Paragraph 26, but no Scripture is quoted. With blasphemous presumption, they openly claimed the power of creating God, the Creator of all things. All Christians were required on pain of death to avow their faith in this horrible, heaven-insulting heresy, and multitudes who refused 
were given to the flames, were burned at the stake. Is it any wonder that the invisible college, the worshippers of Mystery Babylon, those who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages, hate Christianity? Still, another fabrication was needed to enable Rome to profit by the fears and vices of her adherents, and this was supplied by the doctrine of indulgences. Full remission of sins, past, present, and future, and release from all the pains and penalties incurred, were promised to those who would enlist in the pontiff's wars to extend his temporal dominion to punish his enemies, or to exterminate those who dared deny his spiritual supremacy. The people were taught that by the payment of money to the church they might free themselves from sin and release the souls of their deceased friends who were confined in the tormenting flames. By such means Rome filled her coffers and sustained the magnificent luxury and vice of the pretended representatives of him who had not where to lay his head. And the old Roman Empire flourished under the guise of the Vatican the papacy, the Catholic Church. In the 13th century was established that most terrible of all the engines of the papacy, the Inquisition. The Prince of Darkness worked through the leaders of the papal hierarchy in their secret councils. Satan and his angels controlled the minds of evil men who invented tortures too horrible to appear to human eyes. Babylon the Great was drunken with the blood of the saints. The mangled forms of millions of martyrs cried to God for vengeance upon that apostate power. This is word to word from history, folks. Popery became the world's despot. Kings and emperors bowed to the decrees of the Roman pontiff. The destinies of men, both for time and for eternity, seemed under his control. For hundreds of years, the doctrines of Rome had been extensively and implicitly received. Its rites reverently performed and its festivals observed. Its clergy were honored and liberally sustained, but the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. That was written by J.A. Wiley in the History of Protestantism. Now, Protestantism is not lily-white either. I use that term lily-white because throughout history it's been used to describe good. But in fact, in many instances, there's nothing good about it whatsoever. Protestantism, folks, began in the Reformation. When Martin Luther rebelled against the Pope, but did you know that Martin Luther used as his personal seal the rose and the cross, revealing that he himself, he himself was an initiate of the mystery school, the ancient religion of Babylon. You see, I'm not attacking anyone, and I'm not putting anyone on a pedestal. I'm not tearing down the Vatican in order to build up the Protestant Church, for they are equally guilty. Protestantism has fractured the teachings of Christ into thousands of sects and cults and little groups, all of them professing to know the truth. None of them really do. The Holy Scriptures were almost unknown, not only to the people, but to the priests. God's law, the standard of righteousness in those days, having been removed, papist leaders exercised power without limit and practiced vice without restraint, fraud, avarice, and profligacy prevailed. Men shrank from no crime by which they could gain wealth or position. The palaces of popes and prelates were scenes of the vilest debauchery. Some of the reigning pontiffs were guilty of crimes so revolting that secular rulers endeavored to depose these dignitaries of the church as monsters too vile to be tolerated. For centuries, Europe made no progress in learning arts or civilization. A moral and intellectual paralysis had fallen upon the world. The noon of the papacy, according to history, was the midnight of the world. Foremost among those who were called to lead the church from the darkness of popery into the light of a pure faith stood Martin Luther. And this is what people believe, but Martin Luther himself was an initiate of the mystery schools. 
a follower of the faith of Mystery Babylon, as was the Pope and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. You see, but they were buying for rulership of the world, and up until not too long ago, have always been throughout history. For the Vatican practices the corrupted worship of Mystery Babylon, the combination of Christianity and the worship of Mystery Babylon, whereas the Mystery Schools retain the pure form of Mystery Babylon. And this is the only difference between the two folks, and they have been vying throughout history for the rulership of the world. Mystery Babylon attempting to destroy the Pope and Christianity, and the Pope attempting to persecute and burn away the followers, the initiates of Mystery Babylon. And it has always been the goal of the worshippers of Mystery Babylon to speak one of their own upon the throne of the Vatican. And they have succeeded. They have succeeded, folks. And now you are seeing the beginning of the combination of all religions into one world religion. And while the world and the New Age movement may be waiting for the emergence of Maitreya, I tell you now here, and remember, that I have been the most accurate in making predictions about future world events than anyone in the history of the world, based upon study and knowledge, not psychic ability, not any gift given to me from God, although I am a messenger, I can assure you of that. I tell you that in the New World Order, the one world charismatic and religious leader will be seated upon the throne of Rome. Mark my words. And for those of you who do not understand yet, the Protestant religion was created by the mystery schools to bring down, bring down the authority of the Pope. Just as this nation, the United States of America, was created by the mystery schools to topple the monarchs, the kings and queens, from their thrones. You see, whatever you want to believe in, folks, is okay with me. Let's just believe from a position of knowing the truth. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. The hour of the time may be contacted at hot 
That's H O T T, P O Box 940, Eager, spelled E A G A R, in the state of Arizona, 85925. Our phone number is 928 333 2942. And our website is www.hourofthetime.com. Time.com. 